Hey everybody, uh, so today is actually a really good day to be in the forest because it is not negative degrees, it's only about 20. And check that out, we got about five inches of snow and it's still coming down a little bit. But I figured what a good time to learn about another invasive species. So we're going to learn about one of the saddest stories in the American forest that's going on right now. And there's a couple of different reasons I want to talk about it, but we're going to bring those all in. So this is going to be a really long, like 30,000 lines up their story, but I, I swear and I promise you're going to learn like five things. So today I'm going to teach you all about our beautiful ash trees. This is Fraxinus, probably Americana, could be Fraxinus Pennsylvanica, but it is no longer alive because you guessed it, an invasive insect. So you don't need to be an expert on your forest trees in order to understand that this tree is not doing too good, right? We have a really clear distinction of where the bark is coming off the main core wood of the tree, and just look at that, that's not a good time up there. So this separation of the bark from the wood is all due to the feeding habit of the insect, which is the emerald hash borer. Here's its scientific name, Agrillus planipenis. Sounds like an ex-boyfriend. And the emerald ash borer is actually, it's gorgeous, but it's, it's a really tiny uh, beetle. It's not that long. It's probably only about that long, and it's very slender. Here's a little picture of it. But it's not that adult, that beautiful, shiny adult that we see that causes the most damage to trees. It's actually the larval stage. And the larval stage actually looks like a little worm, and it crawls around on here. These are its galleries, its trails of feeding. And what that larva does, you can see it. It's eaten this live part of the tree, the cambium, or it used to be alive, and that's why the tree is dead. And this larva only eats the cambium, which is this very thin, you can see I'm pulling it off. It's the only living section of the tree, which is responsible for transporting sugars down into the roots. But look at how thin it is, look at how thin it is. Can you see how it's completely severed? by this one insect here. And when you have many, many, many insects inside of one tree, they actually girdle this transport of sugars down to the roots and they starve the tree. It's not able to make, to function at all. So the larva is what actually does the most damage. And the thing is, foresters like us can't see inside of the tree when this is normally closed and the larva and they're doing damage. We can only start to notice signs of their uh, bad deeds inside by something called the adult's exit hole. See, there's one. So that hole, it's a little old because this tree's been dead for a while. We could probably find some better ones other place. See that like oblong shape, how it's flat and then around? It's called a D-shaped exit hole. And there's a bunch of them on here. But we can also notice these other signs too, right? So you have internal decay allowing these mushrooms to come out of the tree because these species of mushrooms only grow on dead or dying trees. So we have two clues and we could go in and actually check out and see if there is cambial feeding. So as a land manager or a forester, you have to be able to notice external signs of a lot of these tree species. And you look for things that are really tiny on the outside, like those D-shaped exit holes or mushrooms, or um, a lack of foliar growth because the lack of transport between all those sugars, between the roots and the um, foliage, you'll actually see a very thin foliar crown on these ash trees in the forest. Speaking of those signs, I just found another one. Uh, this is very characteristic of late infestation in your forest of ash trees. So here we have our ash, and check it out. See this, and that, and that, and that. That abnormality, you see how it's lighter, maybe blonder? Well, we actually call this blonding. And this is a sign of emerald bo ash borers inside of this tree because, see that? Who do you think did that? A woodpecker. A woodpecker did that looking for the insects inside. So they fleck off this bark trying to get to the larva right in underneath the bark there. So I didn't film me swinging this because it was pretty pathetic. Ugh, but look at that. Completely dead cambium. And right there, the beginning of those galleries we saw earlier. So the cambium is completely dead and there's a lot of the insects frass, which is their poopy, and some of those galleries present. Something else about this insect, I don't know if you watched the hemlock gully adelgia when I did, but remember how that insect, the hemlock gully adelgia, had a slight preference for different age trees? This guy does not. Oh, this is a perfect hole. Emerald ash borer does not care about the age of the tree. But look at this is a perfect, more fresh example. See that D-shaped exit hole? See, it looks just like a D, right? The letter. And check it out. Oh, 
perfect. This one is much fresher than the other other things we saw earlier. So this has probably happened like in the last, I don't know, two years. But check that out. Look at all that cambial feeding. And lots of these exit holes present in the bark. So currently now it is very hard to find an ash tree that is alive where I live. And uh, especially in the northern states where emerald ash borer was first introduced, good luck finding live ash trees that are mature in the forest. But if I could find a live ash tree, I would show you because there is a super high probability that it would be infected with insects. The larva actually overwinter. And this is the part where it starts to all come together of these five stories that you'll learn. And really cold temperatures like what we had for the last two days of negative degrees actually are powerful enough to kill these insects. So when we had the last polar vortex in 2014, uh, we actually noticed a lot of emerald ash borers and the Hemocolia delgid died. Their populations actually crashed because they were prolonged to negative degrees for a certain period of time and it broke their super cooling abilities. However, there's a really important part to that that I just said several days. So it has to be about negative 35 for a couple of days to actually drop the population. So what we had here in Appalachia the last couple of days wasn't enough. So you'd still find them in your trees trucking on totally okay. With the increase in climate change and the increase of the probability of these polar vortexes that we're going to have because the cold wind is just blowing down from the caps because there's not that anywhere else to go except for here now, we may actually see drops in uh, the populations of invasive species but also native species. So uh, climate change is still a lose-lose situation, of course. So we likely won't see ash trees come back. There will always be a population of lingering emerald ash borers as the age group of ashes continues to grow that has enough bark for them to infiltrate and kill. We probably won't see things like uh, baseball bats made out of ash. The way that ash trees grow, they're actually super awesome for baseball bats. And I actually went to a, a Mets game, gross, but I went to a Mets game and uh, five bats shattered. That's because they're made out of maple. So, goodbye, Major League Baseball dreamers. So sorry, it does sound kind of doom and gloomy, but wait, there is science, of course, right? We love science. So there's a couple of things going on in order to try to combat these massive populations of emerald ash borer that are destroying all of our ash trees in America. One of the things that a couple of different universities and Forest Service and other groups are trying to work on is bringing in natural parasitoids. Do you know what a parasitoid is? Do you think I do? Yeah, I do. I'll just learn. So there's actually a couple of hymenopterans. What's a hymenopteran? It's a wasp. And they're in the group, uh, I think they're braconids. There's another one too. But they are parasitoids. And one is an ectoparasitoid and one is an endoparasitoid. And what a parasitoid does, which is different than just a regular parasite, is, well, let's think about it. So a tick. A tick is a parasite, right? Because it goes on your skin and it sucks your guts directly. That's a parasite. Well, a parasitoid lays eggs inside or on the body that'll have its babies that eat your body. So the most promising, in my opinion, and other researchers' opinions, is Spathius agrilli, which is a super tiny little wasp, and it's an ectoparasite, lays its eggs on the outside of the larva, so those babies will hatch and they'll eat the emerald ash borer larva. Pretty cool, huh? And the other one is a tetrastitious plenty. Pinnacy. <laughs> that one <laughs> lays its eggs inside of the larva, so that's actually a endoparasitoid, and so the little babies will eat it from the inside out. Man, that's a nightmare, huh? Hmm, got some crusty fungus right here. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the next science lesson before my toes fall off because they're they're buried. But um, the next science lesson is that there actually seems to be some sort of resistance with another species of ass. Ash. <laughs> So there's blue ash, and that's really not that common. Um, I've seen it in Ohio a bunch, like around uh, Cincinnati area, but it is Fraxinus quadrangulata, and uh, it seems to have a resistance, which is actually associated with why it's called blue ash. Uh, there is a chemical which the emerald ash borer larva appear to not like, but it's something that's being studied. So there's scientists doing two things to try and figure out why it's resistant, and then see if maybe they can insert that gene. Uh oh, GMOs, look out! If they can insert that gene into other 
fresh species, right? But uh, they have found that it actually associates with the stress level of the tree. So if a tree is not stressed, it is resistant. But if a blue ash tree gets stressed out, maybe by some other kind of pathogen, the emerald ash borers are actually able to attack it. So it's not completely resistant. It's situationally tolerant. And there's one more lesson that I'm going to tell you in this free internet session. Uh, you guys can print out your degrees at www.kdubs.com. <laughs> so if you live in the southern states like I do, or if you're hiking on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia or Tennessee or North Carolina, you can actually see another tree that is not in the same genus as ash. Uh, you can see fringe tree. Fringe tree is in the same family, Oleaceae, and it is also attacked by emerald ash borer. Pretty nuts, right? So maybe after today, you'll be inspired to go learn a little bit more about entomology and uh, parasitoids, or maybe you'll be a little bit more interested in learning about genetics and why are uh, members of the Oleaceae both affected by emerald ash borer, or you could just study trees like this one, Tree of Heaven peanut butter smell. Okay, I'll see you later. Thank you.